This is The Comics Alternative, Episode 227, Reviews of Untitled Ape's Epic Adventure, Blood Blister No. 1, and The Belfry. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this week's episode, Andy and I are going to be looking at three new or upcoming titles. We're going to begin with Stephen Tillotson's Untitled Apes Epic Adventure. After that, we're going to look at issue number one of Blood Blister, written by Phil Hester, with art by Tony Harris. And we're going to wrap up with The Belfry, a one-shot from Gabriel Hardman. But before we get to those reviews, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover, sometimes 50% off, but many times you can find discounts that go higher than that. That's right, and this month is in every month. They have a load of bundles that you can take advantage of where you can get a deeper discount on multiple comics from the same publisher, deeper than what you would get if you bought those comics individually. And the and as usual, they have a load of bundles from DC, some bundles from Marvel, and Valiant as well. So check those out to get 50%. Off. That's right. But you know, whether you like your specials bundled or in single issue, it doesn't matter. Discount Comic Book Service has tons of specials every single month, and February is no different. So be sure to go to DCBService.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, before we get into this week's reviews, we should announce that we have a brand new podcast patron. That's great. Yes. In fact, this is someone who has been supporting us in the past for a dollar a month, but he upped his game uh, several days ago and now has become an official podcast patron, and that is Davis Morgan. Davis, welcome to the renowned and uh, stunning list of uh, official podcast patrons. Yeah, thanks for increasing your, your donation to, to join that elite group. That's right. Uh, and in fact, we should also run down a list of some of the other podcast patrons we have because it's their support as well that uh, helps to bring this show to you. So in addition to Davis Morgan, we also have Ala Rule, Sturge Bakzakas, Scott Bofus, Nick Prolix, Christopher Baird, Pathik Thomas, Art Bowser, Daniel White, Christopher Michael, Paul Lai, Sal Good Sam, Michael Norhale, Don Witzel, Simon Brilsby, David Campbell, and Rainer Koshnick. Yeah, thanks all you guys. Yeah, uh, we really do appreciate it. And if you want to get in on the fun and find out what our Patreon campaign is all about, then go to patreon.com slash comics alternative. That's patreon.com slash comics alternative. And you'll find a nifty little video that explains it all. You'll see the reward levels. You can also get there by going to our website, uh, comicsalternative.com, and then click on the support the two guys through Patreon banner. Yeah, please check that out and and support us if you can. Yes. Well, one of the things I should mention, I guess, before we get too far into the episode, is that uh, I'm I'm recording in a slightly different location. Normally, I record in my office, which is in the second floor of the house. And t- today, because I am um, I'm home alone right now, 
uh, and I have to keep an eye on the dogs. I'm recording in my my breakfast nook, <laughs> <laughs> and so I am surrounded by a, the variety of animals that we have in this this house, which is uh, four cats and two dogs. So. Uh, the two dogs may end up uh, wanting to participate in the podcast. So just to give our listeners a heads up that they might hear uh, hear the dogs participating. Yeah. So, yeah, if you hear Andy's dogs in the background, just, you know, accept it for, you know, for <laughs> the interruption you've been warned about. Uh, but listeners to the podcast um, have heard dogs in the background several times in the past, I'm sure. I know yeah. that my dog Chester, which is a sheepdog, has a very deep bark, even from several rooms away downstairs as I normally record upstairs in my house. You can still hear him. Uh, I know Sean also, uh, when we do the web comics series, his dogs every now and again bark. And, and sometimes we hear yours as well, Andy. Yeah, yeah, they're usually downstairs and 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 still can be heard upstairs because my office doesn't have a door on it. But um yeah, and and since one of the one of the works we're dealing with at least or at least one of them has a cat in it. <laughs> I'm, ho- I'm hoping that they don't they don't decide to participate and 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 another dog and birds. And I know whenever we watch a TV show or something that has a dog in it, um the dogs go nuts at it. Well, let's hope your dogs don't understand you as you talk about these animals in uh, the upcoming discussion. Yeah, that's true. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and get into that conversation. Uh, The first book we're going to be looking at this week is titled Untitled Apes Epic Adventure, and this is by Stephen Tillotson, and it's published by Avery Hill Publishing. Uh, This came out back in the fall in the UK, which is where Avery Hill is based, Uh, but it's just recently become available this year in the United States through Retrofit, because Retrofit is the distributor, Retrofit Big Planet, the distributors of uh, the Avery Hill books in the US. Mm. So even though this is not brand new here, um, it's been out in the UK for a while, or it wasn't brand new in the UK. Um, it is the first time that, let's say, American readers could have relatively easy access to this. Right, right. And um, and as the, as the book indicates, Tillotson is the runner-up of the Observer Jonathan Cape Comicographics Short Story Prize. Uh, and I think that's, that's a prize that previously was won by Isabel Greenberg, right? Uh, was it? I don't know. I think I'm pretty sure she won. She won. I don't know if there's a lot of a lot of comic short graphic short story pri- prizes that are sponsored by newspapers in the UK. So maybe there is another one. Yeah. Um, but but I seem to remember this award coming up in a previous podcast. Hmm. Okay. Now, now this this book is interesting. I did learn about this first back in the fall, and that's when the publicist of Avery Hill Publishing, uh, Katriana Chapman – and by the way, uh, a big, big thank you to Katriana because over the past couple of years – or I guess almost two years, she has been really, really good at reaching out to us and letting us know if uh, we're, we'd be interested in any Af- uh, uh, Avery Hill titles. Uh, we've gotten some interviews uh, through her and her work with Avery Hill. And we also did – it was Gwen and I who did the Avery Hill Publisher Spotlight last year. So uh, anyway, uh, Katriana reached out to me with a digital copy of Untitled Apes Epic Adventure and a few other fall releases from Avery Hill. And when I saw Untitled Apes Epic Adventure and just the art, I didn't really read through the book carefully, but I saw the art. And I forwarded that PDF to Gwen and Andy Wolverton, who do the Young Reader Show, because I thought, okay, this is a book for young readers. 
And then Gwen and Andy responded uh, a couple days later saying, thanks, but I, I don't know if we're going to be able to, to discuss this on the show. And then I took a look at it and thought, oh, I see what they're saying now because it's really mm -hmm. not a young reader's book. But it does have that feel uh, visually. Uh, do you think so? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I think I think that what, what you're getting at there is something that I was thinking about in relationship to this book in any way and how this book kind of fits into contemporary comics. And that is that, uh, I think, I think it was a, probably a couple of years ago when we were talking about one of the, um, um, year's best comics, um, collections or, you know, from, um, the, that we do at the end of every year from the Houghton and, Mifflin. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I was I was trying to make some comments about like kind of the state of especially of independent comics based on what we see in those those collections. And I think one of the things I mentioned was that there seems to be a lot of of comics that I might categorize as as fables, especially animal fables. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, I think this falls under that category. So I think if you took a cursory glance at this and you see that it is about um, a, a, a giant purple creature that is the untitled ape, uh, who's not really an ape uh, to speak of, and, um, and his pal, the cat, uh, on an epic adventure, it certainly does look like it, it could be a children's book. But definitely when you get into it, it's not. Right. Yeah, and so yeah, when I first saw this uh, back in the fall, I didn't read it, which is my mistake. And then I passed it on to mm -hmm. Gwen and Andy, saying, "Okay, well, this is something you guys may be interested in." But yeah, uh, you know, once I read the book, I realized uh, it's something quite different. And I, th I think uh, you're onto something in describing it as kind of a fable-like narrative that uses animals, um, but but in ways that you know, definitely not, let's say, a typical fairy tale, or definitely not a children's right. story. Although, I mean, I think it's something that younger readers could appreciate to some degree, maybe not too young. Um, but I but I mentioned my introduction to this title just to, I guess, foreground the art because it does have that kind of all age or young reader feel to it. But but don't be fooled by that, as I was initially. Uh, it, it's actually. Uh, a rather sophisticated story. Uh, it, it's divided into five chapters plus a prologue and epilogue. And basically what you have uh, is, you know, the protagonist... Well, we have two protagonists here. There is Ape, or Untitled Ape, if we want to call him that, as and his traveling companion, Cat. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you were saying that Untitled Ape is not really an ape. Uh, and the, I, that's true. And I like the way that he's described on the back of the book. A giant purple ghost beast. Mm -hmm. And that may not make sense to those who haven't seen this book, but that's okay. Just hang with us here. Uh, he is a giant purple ghost beast because when we see him at the very beginning, he kind of like just emanates from the ground as a ghost. And then he becomes a purple ape shaped creature. And why do you say ape? Uh, why does he necessarily have to look like an ape? And to some degree, he does with the bigger arms, uh, really muscular. And as we get toward the end of the book, and and, and that's something that we don't want to tip um, and spoil. Um, but let's just say that calling him Untitled Ape definitely makes sense once you get near the very end of this story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's journeying along, and then he comes across the character Cat, who I guess that's the character's name, Cat. It's a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a wisecracking, uh, kind of a sarcastic, at times sour cat. And Cat has a pack of cigarettes that he loses into, I guess, the inside of a tree trunk, and he can't reach it. And so he sees Untitled Ape coming along, and he says, hey, can you do me a favor? You're a big guy. Can you break into this tree trunk and get uh, get my cigarettes? And so that's how Untitled Ape meets Cat. <laughs> Yeah, and then they go they go on a series of adventures that involve um, a massive worldwide flood, <laughs> um, uh, a, a a journey to the jungle that takes them first to Antarctica, yeah, and then to um, the top of Big Mountain, where um, 
where there is a cloud city in which you can go get to anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so the, the narrative, it, it feels like the narrative has a real improvisate improvisational quality to it. Right. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, a, a clear beginning and end, but the, the route it takes to get to the end, um, feels like it takes some surreal turns that don't necessarily um, feel like they they make a lot of sense in 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 terms of a you know kind of narrative logic right and I think the way you described it kind of surreal and improvisational uh, I think that's spot on and in fact at one point um, cat even makes a comment to Untitled Ape that he really doesn't know what he's doing. He's kind of making it up as he's going along because, you know, Ape tells Cat at the very beginning, I'm heading to the jungle. You know, I know I have to be there. You know, people that I know there, I have to... He doesn't know the details, exactly why he needs to go to the jungle. He just Mm -hmm. knows that he's drawn to the jungle uh, for an important mission. Uh, And then, you know, soon after the flood, when they end up in Antarctic... uh, um, and they actually meet a yeti in a in a, in a mammoth, a woolly mammoth, mm-hmm. uh, or a whole whole herd of uh, mammoth. Uh, the cat says, "You know, hey, you're going to the jungle, and you end up here, you know, in Antarctica uh, with all the snow. That doesn't really make sense, and you know, it doesn't. But that's okay. I mean, that that's the way that this story evolves. And part of the fun of Untitled Ape's epic adventure is not so much, or not only, let's say, the interaction between Ape and Cat, but the many other characters that they meet along the way. So in in the flood, uh, they save this uh, mother dog uh, who rows with them for a while, and then they drop her off in a large building where she just by chance happens to meet her son. Uh, who is not being good when it comes to his his <laughs> nu- nutritional care, uh, and then they meet uh, Gary Narwhal, uh, a narwhal whale, and uh, they meet the the aforementioned mammoth, and then the yeti, and then up in the cloud uh, realm they meet a character called the sage, which is supposed to tell them you know what's going on in their lives and what to expect and all of that. And then there are the evil creatures and the henchmen that are after Ape and Cat. Now, there's a raven that we see following the two, and, whose name is Kevin. And he, he's not the most competent uh, tail uh, alive, but you know he, he does at times stumble upon Ape and uh, tries to foil their progress. And then there's... I guess the main henchman. I don't know if he's. I don't think he's ever given a name. But the, it, it's it's a bird. Is it a wren? Who wears no, the fedora? I, yeah, I'm not sure what kind of bird that is, but yeah, a yeah. bird with a fedora. Yeah, that that actually nests itself in a body without a head, and so it looks like that this is a humanoid bird smoking a cigarette with a hat with a fedora. Uh, but actually, it's a bird that's sitting into, I guess, the neck cavity of a body. It, 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 again, surreal is the word to describe it here. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of strange characters, a lot of weird situations. And, and for that reason, it, it's a really fun read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's a nice can ride to go on. You know, you get into the um, – you know the lack of of kind of clear story logic, and that's okay. Um, it's fun to follow along in that way. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, now we learn, and this is not a spoiler, um, but we do learn about halfway through the book that Ape is has escaped from and doesn't want to return to some kind of hellish region. It, it could be hell. Uh, uh, but it's a different kind of hell, really, the way that it's uh, illustrated. Um, but he doesn't want to be a part of that existence anymore. And so that's why Kevin the Raven and then this bird wren humanoid thing, uh, they're after him to try to get him, convince him to come back down to hell and work with them in tormenting souls. But Ape doesn't want anything to do with this. Um, 
Now, again, we're not going to give away what happens toward the end that has something to do with why we call Untitled Ape an ape. Uh, But I think at the very end, that's when a lot of this stuff seems to come together. So if you do uh, read this book, and we we recommend. I mean, it's something that you should seek out and read. It is fun. Um, And if you're reading this story and you're thinking that this is just kind of an improv journey and doesn't seem to make much sense outside of just the enjoyment of seeing what happens next, well, there is a a larger message that's being told here, and that comes together toward the very end. But again, we don't want to give that away. Yeah, I think that's interesting how much you're 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 resisting spoilers because <laughs> I don't I don't I didn't get the feeling as I was reading it of of any kind of real like twists or surprises to the point that um you know that that you know that that I would feel um any more kind of I don't know uh shocked or whatever by by a narrative turn than i than i was by you know the fact that they end up in antarctica on their way to the jungle uh you know that that just it just again it just feels like the the story goes in whatever direction tillotson is uh is writing it and you know maybe that ending you know maybe the overall quest was kind of um thought out in advance in terms of where the you know the reason why um untitled ape is is doing what he's doing what he's running away from and and what he's trying to get to uh but it it feels like the steps in between there are um are are much more random than um than building towards an inevitable climax yeah. See, yeah. What we're talking about occurs in the last chapter and um, chapter <laughs> six. I think earlier I said it's five chapters, the six chapters. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and chapter six is called "The Jungle and the End," and there is, in fact, one page in particular. And this is when Cat tells Ape what time and date it is. And mm-hmm. when Ape realizes the actual date, that triggers something inside of him. And then we get – and we don't have page numbers here, unfortunately, or I would refer to the page number. But this is the one where we have – what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, we have about 24 small panels on that page. And mm-hmm. that's where I think much of the revelation takes place that I was teasing but I'm not <laughs> going to be specific about. Um, I do feel that this is – a point that Tillotson was leading to. I mean, it just strikes me that if everything before this point seems to have been possibly improvised in, 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 a, in, a, in a really good way, um, this is where he always wanted to go with the message. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this story, but I think this is this is the moral uh, point to take away from this book. Sure, sure, and that's kind of what I'm saying is that the book seems to be framed by – Oh, I see. I see. Um, a, a beginning, uh, a quest that he's on, and then and an ending to that quest. But you know, I guess we could describe the middle, the most of the middle section as kind of picaresque. Right. Um, you know, we meet these meet these things like uh, like the yeti, the yeti and the mammoth that like to um, give each other a hard time. <laughs> right. Um. That that's a lot of fun. Um. It doesn't really move the plot forward in any meaningful way, but it's fun, you know. Right. So I'm not saying these things as as kind of criticisms, you know. Uh, the picaresque has been around yeah, for, for, for centuries, yeah. <laughs> and so so for millennia. So we don't, you know, you know, it's, it would be it would be like saying that Don Quixote's not doesn't hold together as a novel or something like that. Right. So. Um, so I'm not I'm not being critical of it, but it is it is a fun path that this that this work takes. But we're also you know dealing with a character of Untitled Ape who who doesn't who doesn't talk a lot in the book. I think um, Cat does does more of the talking, um, but we do get a sense that Ape is um, you know he's haunted by his past and he and he's looking for a resolution. Right. 
Uh, now, were you familiar with anything that Tillotson had done previous to this? No, I'm not. No, yeah, same here. And um, it, it's it's got me wanting to look him up now because in the about the author section at the very end, it says that um, this is his second publication with Avery Hill, following Manly Boys and Comely Girls annuals. Uh, hmm. And but he's also done other things, and they they list some of the titles here, which which are intriguing. Um, his works include. Ethel Sparrowhawk's Terrible Hangover, Christopher Wren in Search of Excitement, Banal Pig Comics Issues 1 through 4, and Banal Pig Showcase. Now, I, I, I should have looked those up because they sound like they're not real, but they could be, um, for all we know. And then it says his I Yeti story mm. uh, was, a, was the runner-up that you mentioned in The Observer, Jonathan Cape. Graphic mm. short story prize in 2012, and this is the same Yeti, by the way, in this story uh, right. that was runner up that we get in this book, Untitled Apes right. Epic Adventure. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I want to look him up now. Yeah, yeah the um, the Yeti story is diff- is is not it. We don't we don't get the like he doesn't insert that Yeti story from 2012 mm. into this book. It's more like you know, you have the Yeti character. So, you know, if, if someone wants to go look up I Yeti by Stephen Tillotson, mm-hmm. um, which they can find on the Guardian or the Observer's website, you can um, you can, can kind of get a good sense of what his style is like. Right. Um, but, you know, that's one of the great things about Avery Hill is most of the things that I've seen that they've published – uh, they're by creators that I have not been familiar with before. And that's one yeah. of the things that struck me when Gwen and I did the Avery Hill uh, Publisher Spotlight last year. Uh, and and, and I, I guess because this is a UK publisher and they do s- very, very small press kind of stuff. In other words, it makes sense that Big Planet Retrofit is their U.S. distributor mm-hmm. because they seem to me to do in the U.K. what Retrofit Big Planet does here in the U.S. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, definitely check out uh, Untitled Apes Epic Adventure. Yep. Okay, the next title we're going to discuss is a new Aftershock, uh, this uh, a book. This is Blood Blister, number one, written by Phil Hester, with art by Tony Harris, and this came out this month. Yes, yeah. and we've talked about, um, we did a, a publisher spotlight on Aftershock when the first few comics came out that's right i think and this is the first aftershock comic that we have discussed on the show since then right right um so yeah this is um this this is interesting in that we have um i guess the premise is you got a main character named brand hull and when we see him at the very beginning of this first issue he's talking with uh, a family in oklahoma the travis family uh, asking them if they want to join a class action action suit against the state of Oklahoma uh, because of the, the toxic crap that mm-hmm. their uh, environmental protection agency had, or their office had been allowing into the environment. And the, the Travis family doesn't want to have anything to do with it. They don't want any trouble. They don't think that there's any problem. Uh, and then we learn after his visit with the Travis family – uh, Hull meets with a guy who I guess he works for a chemical company, WPB, or the initials of mm-hmm. the company, some guy named Mr. Shaney. And uh, we we learn that Brad Hull's intentions with the Travis family wasn't as altruistic or at least as noble, let's say, as we may have been led to think at the beginning – that the reason why he's asking everyone in this particular region of Oklahoma to sign the class action action suit against the state is so that they wouldn't pay attention to the kind of industrial dumping, the poisoning that WPB 
the chemical or oil company. Mm-hmm. I, they never explain exactly what it is, uh, but th- by focused on the it, state. It is an oil company. It oh, does it's say a, it's an oil company. Oh, it does company. say it's an oil company. Okay, I guess I missed that. Yeah. So, so it's an oil company. Uh, so in other words, the oil company can get away with what it's doing. Mm-hmm. And so we learned yeah. that Hull is uh, much more underhanded. Yeah, well, it, it it sounds like that the the class action lawsuit against the state of Oklahoma is kind of a I don't know like a, a red herring like that right. that it doesn't matter whether that that lawsuit succeeds it it diverts the responsibility away from this petroleum company and towards the um, towards the state. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, and there's, there's the reason why I mentioned that it's an oil company is because there is the kind of, um, there's this kind of satiric joke in the middle of, of the book where, um, the WPB representatives wonder, well, uh, what about Oklahoma going after WPB then? Right. <laughs> and they say, well, you know, Oklahoma's never going to go after a, an oil company, um, so, which is probably true. Right. Um, and, you know, um, Hester had no way of knowing this when he wrote this story, but uh, now this seems rather prescient in that, uh, you know, our recently uh, approved captain member you know, for the EPA is actually from Oklahoma, and he was notorious for letting a lot of this crap uh, get through. Sure, sure, and for for suing the EPA. Yeah, yeah. The guy <laughs> running the EPA had sued the EPA. Yeah. Sure, and um, uh, yeah. So I think that that is that is there's interesting commentary on this, you know, and and they extend that into you know the fact that that Brand Brand Hull had done similar things for. Um, you know, a chemical company in Ohio, a paper company in West Virginia, and another another company in Pennsylvania. Uh, so this this is his specialty. His specialty is to, uh, w- which does seem kind of counterintuitive, to encourage regular citizens to take on these class action lawsuits that looks like look like they could damage the companies, but in order to divert the attention away from the legal attention away from those companies. So, so he is, he is, he is pretty scummy guy, right? But not just in his professional life, but also his personal life. He sends his secretary out to watch his son's baseball game for him, for example. Yeah. Um, So it'll look like he was watching his son from a distance and his son will think that he was watching him, but he didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So most of this issue seems to be taking up um, showing showing what a scumbag brand hall is. Right. Um, Because we don't really get a lot. uh, We don't we only really get a sort of introduction to the plot in the last few pages or what we anticipate is going to be the ongoing plot in the last few pages of the book. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we even get a little tease as to what kind of a scumbag he is at toward the very beginning when he goes right. to visit the Travis family. And the Travis family has, um, I guess, a mentally disabled daughter who is obese and normally would not be able to speak. Um, but when she sees Hull, she starts spouting, you know, uh, you are of your father, the devil. Yeah, and the lusts of your father, you will do. And so she she goes on, and and uh, Hull makes a comment and says, "Wow, your uh, your little girl sure does know her scripture." <laughs> and then and then the father says, "That's weird because she's never talked before." So we know mm-hmm. something's up. But then we you know bit by bit in the pages that follow learn that you know this guy is uh, not the most uh, <laughs> admirable character. And then, and this is where the title comes into play, there is uh, a guy um, who is outside the building that I guess Shaney at WPB um, is where, where Hull is going to meet him. 
and he has one of the sandwich boards and like, you know, the end of the world is near or something like that. And he starts spouting off to uh, not only the people around him, but to, to Hull and follows him into the building and falls on top of him. And his secretary, Carla, makes a comment, oh, you're going to get a you're going to get a bruise on that or with that. And so in other words, he was hurt in some way. Um, now, the first time I read this, I didn't catch that. Mm-hmm. And so when I saw him later with this blister that turned out to be a blood blister, uh, I wondered where did that come from? Uh, but then when I went back to read this first issue a second time, I saw that he got this from that homeless guy, apparently homeless guy, falling on top of him because uh, the secretary makes that comment. Oh, you know, that's going to leave a bruise right there. Um, now, I, I guess we'll find out more about what this blood blister is all about in subsequent issues. But, you know, that part of this issue where he's picking and is at least one page where he's picking at this blood blister. Mm-hmm. Um, I think two pages, maybe. Um, that's gross. That that had to be the gross out part of this first issue for me is when he, he's talking on the phone to his wife. His wife is getting on his case about, you know, you know. You disappointed your son. He thought that that was you in the car. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. And he punctures by squeezing this blister, and he drips blood, and there's a lot of blood, into mm-hmm. this waste basket. Yeah. We should point out it's his ex-wife that he's talking to. Oh, did I not say ex-wife? You said wife. Oh, wife. Okay, yeah, it's his ex-wife. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And then uh, his ex-wife tells him that he should at least – try to make it up to his son by visiting him uh, at a haunted house that he's working at uh, with his scout troop. Mm -hmm. And so Hull goes there, and then that's where this first issue ends. Uh, What happens in that fun house basically is, I guess, the punctuation mark on what we can expect in the the issues to come. Right, right, yeah, and so – so something strange happens in this haunted house. It's clearly not unless, uh, unless the, these kids are really, really good with their special <laughs> effects. It, uh, the place he enters is, is definitely not like a, a JC, the JC's regular JC's haunted house that one might find in their own town. Right. Um, and so that is um, that is basically where the the issue ends with mm-hmm. brand uh trapped in this uh, haunted house being kind of visited on by his his sins and other people are in there too for similar reasons right uh now one of the things you mentioned you know the that's that that's where this ends um and it a it ends on the 20th page of story i like blood blister number one i, I thought it was a pretty good setup uh i'm intrigued i i want to continue reading but th- this is something thing, something that I found with other Aftershock titles, especially first issues, and that is many times when I get to the end, I don't feel that I have as much story as I would like. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I felt that way when I read Animosity a few months ago. I thought that the story that I got was, was really good, but I felt shortchanged. It was uh, just like a little tease, and then that's it. It's like, well, give me more story. And I, I don't even know if we got at least 20 pages in the first issue of Animosity. And so we got something similar. I felt something similar with Blood Blister, number one. Did you feel that this first issue didn't have enough substance? Or, or page count, maybe, is a better way of well, putting it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to the page count, but I did feel like um, the – like I said earlier, the primary purpose of this first issue does seem to be to establish Brandhull's character mm-hmm. and then to give us a little a little hint at, at some of the supernatural elements that are that are coming in the book. But um I'm you know, I I don't know if it is enough to get me to wanna read the next issue. You know, it doesn't it doesn't feel like I I don't feel like I know enough. I'm gonna wanna hear, I guess some more about the series and maybe maybe check out the trade and i don't even know if if that'll be the case um at this point i'm kind of really on the fence about this book yeah yeah i i just looked and the it's the last seven arguably eight pages of this first issue that uh, all take place at the haunted house 
And so mm-hmm. I, everything before that, uh, which is most of what we've been discussing, has been condensed into, what, 11 or 12 pages. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I just feel that there should be a little more substance here in this first issue. Nonetheless, I'm intrigued. Um, I think it's an interesting premise – and I do like Tony Harris's art. In fact, I think that was the standout for me in this first. Issue. That's interesting that, that you mention it because you know I'm I've I've liked Tony Harris's work since I guess I first saw it on Starman, mm-hmm. which is a series I really liked, and, and then you know following that with Ex Machina. Um, here, his style is really different. Um, I think you know on Ex Machina you got a lot of process. Um, pieces explaining how Tony Harris did his uh, did his art, and it was heavily photo referenced. Mm-hmm. Um, this doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, a lot of the art here seems to remind me, um, you know, le- less of the kind of photorealistic Tony Harris art, and maybe closer to something like I don't know. Uh, it, sometimes I was reminded a little bit of of like a tighter Harvey Kurtzman. Um, especially in the way the uh, um, the old man is drawn at the beginning of the book and the kind of grotesquerie that's going on there. Um, and and later, I don't know, there, I guess later felt a kind of, you know, again, following the Kurtzman line, a kind of almost mad magazine sense. Right. You know, I agree with art. you. Yeah, I agree with you in that uh, this is a style of Harris's art that is very different from Starman and Ex Machina. Um, and in fact, if you had given me this issue and I didn't know that Tony Harris was the artist, I wouldn't have said that Tony Harris was the artist. Mm. Uh, it, it, this His art here, especially the way that he illustrates the people, much more cartoony than uh, the more mm-hmm. realistic style that we see with you know, Starman or Ex Machina, definitely. But where I do think the Tony Harris style does come through, uh, and you can link it back to those earlier books that we referenced, mm-hmm. is, is his paneling work. Yeah, yeah. And where you have many times no clear sense or uh, let's say straight lines, but more – in other words, you don't have traditional panel layouts, right? Uh, Right. Many times one panel seems to kind of flow into the other. He experiments around with borders. uh, And in fact, sometimes the sweepiness between panels or even panels within panels – uh, I think is it looks quite familiar to the things that we would see in either Storm Man or Ex Machina, and so that I think that is the the Tony Harris that I recognize here, not the way that he draws the people, um, but in the way that he lays out his panels in in an unconventional manner, and, and and I do enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think fans of Tony Harris's work will recognize the page layout and panel designs on many of these, in these places, especially when they're in the office building uh, where, um, where brand is meeting with Shaney HPB. Yeah. You know, or WPB. Yeah. So, and so this is, um, yeah, an, an interesting, I guess we can call it a horror story. Mm-hmm. Although the horror doesn't appear until the last seven or eight pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even when you say that, that's almost half of the. That's like a third of the book. Yeah, and yet, and yet, it doesn't feel like it. I think because a lot of what happens in those seven or eight pages is is um, you know Harris's kind of atmospheric drawing for the um, this kind of hellish place that Brand finds himself in. Right. You know, a lot of that's not necessarily moving the story forward so much as, as creating the sense of horror that um, we're not in, we're not in a, a haunted house the way he expected it to be. Mm-hmm. But you know, Andy, this is not the only horror title that we're looking at this week. Uh, the third one that we're mm-hmm. about to discuss, 
The Belfry is also a horror comic. Uh, this is by Gabriel Hardman. It's a one-shot uh, coming to us. Actually, it'll be released next week from Image. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is this is something quite different from uh, what we have been finding recently with Gabriel Hardman. Yeah, yeah, but it it, it reminds me a bit of the kind of work he did with again with his right his wife Green Bechko on um on the book He's in Town. A number of years ago. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you know, I, I completely forgot about Heathen Town, mm-hmm. which is a, which is another book I really like. Which is a uh, it, it's it's longer than this, but still a pretty short um, one shot uh, horror story. Um, very reminiscent of um, like Warren Magazine stories, especially because of its you know black and white art. And and so I, I do feel like um, like the Belfry is um, is in the same spirit of that, but even maybe more so in that. Well, Hart, first of all, Hardman wrote this himself. And, you know, much like we were I was mentioning that Tony Harris's work at towards the end of Blood Blisters kind of atmospheric. I, I feel like a lot of what this book is, is atmosphere. Right. Um, there isn't. The, the the plot is is very very limited um you know there's a plane that uh that crashes when a um i guess a harpy like woman cra- goes through the windshield um and the survivors find themselves um being kind of captured by these these creatures who turn out to be kind of bat human hybrids and you know, and the horror, I guess, goes on from there. Um, and uh, you know, so so the plot itself is very simple. Hardman doesn't give us a whole lot of information about what's going on, and I think that that adds to the horror. I think that's what one of the things they do really well, or that you know that he and and Cream Bechko has, have done really well with their their past horror work. Um, but I think he's doing it a good job on this solo too in just creating an atmosphere of, of horror, a, a, a situation where we don't know what's going on just as much as the characters don't go know what's going on. And even at the end, I don't, we don't get a whole lot of answers. Uh, and the suspension of that knowledge, I think just increases the horror of the story. Right. Yeah. And in fact, you can't really tell for certain, but it almost seems as if at the very end, this story loops back on itself. Right. Which even adds further to to the horror uh, th- that we have here. Now, I- I'm glad that you mentioned the tone because I think that the thing that defines for me the Belfry, uh, this one shot, I- is tone more than anything. And in, mm-hmm. in reading through this, you're right, there's not a lot of action, but I – at, at times with his art, and his art I think is outstanding, but at times it's difficult to ferret out what exactly mm-hmm. is going on within any particular panel or on any certain page. And with this issue – and it's not that long. Um, I mean this is kind of a regular length comic. Um, mm-hmm. It's not as if this is a one-shot, but it's a larger issue than the normal, like like 40-some pages. It's not at all. Um I had to go back and so many times reread a particular page or a series of pages in order for me to think that I got enough of a sense of what was going on to move on and understand this story. Uh, I couldn't help but feel as I was reading this a sense of claustrophobia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and not only because on some of the pages, you know, the panels, we have like many pages or panels wedged within a page, but even with larger images, I just felt that – the way that he was illustrating this story, it's like we're shown sometimes close-ups, uh, sometimes ill-defined images to the point that it's like you're looking at something up close and you can't get a larger sense of things. That's what I mean by claustrophobic. Uh, and that adds to the horror in this sense of foreboding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and you, you know, you mentioned the size of this issue. I think one of the things that really impressed me about this book is that we don't see this that much. We don't see the one shot single issue, you know, 25 or so page story. Mm-hmm. 
that is complete in and of itself isn't part of a series or anything like that. Um, and, and I really like that. I like that this, this is this kind of one and done experience. Yeah. And I'm glad that you described it early on as something like you would find in a Warren publication. It is. I mean, this mm-hmm. could easily be some, this could be something that would fit easily into a creepy or an eerie, you know, and you'd say, wow, this is like a typical creepy or eerie story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when you mentioned Heathen Town, I didn't even think of that book. And I think it's for this reason. At the very end of uh, The Belfry, uh, Hardman, there's there's one page where he, you know, basically tells the reader why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah. And in essence, it's to take a break from uh, Invisible Republic, uh, another title that he's doing with Karina uh, Bechko, his wife or companion. And um, – uh, you know, he, he's worked with her before, Planet of the Apes, Star Wars Legacy, uh, and, and he tells us this. He said – and he has a really good time doing The Belfry – or I'm sorry, doing Invisible Republic, but he just wanted to take a break from it. And he says, so if you're familiar with my work, let's say on Planet of the Apes or Invisible Republic or even his graphic novel uh, Kinski, which I really enjoy, um, right. this is very different. And I found it curious that he didn't reference Heathentown there, and I think that's why it didn't it didn't occur to me. And it's been a long time since I read Heathentown, um, but that's why I was surprised when you mentioned it. It's like, huh? Why didn't I think of that? It's because he didn't mention it in this afterward, mm-hmm. right? Which is curious because you're right that the tone, the horrific tone, is is very similar to I guess what you find in Heathentown. Yeah, and in fact, I remember talking to to Gabriel Hardman and. Kareen Betchko at, at Heroes Con a number of years ago when Heathen Town came out. And we, we did have that conversation about how it was, you know, it was influenced by, you know, their their love of those those seventies horror comics like you got into Warren magazines. Um there was a lot of um I think a lot of uh Bernie Wrights and influence in that in that particular comic. I don't necessarily see that here. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this is, this is rice rights and influence at all. In fact, I think that the art here is, is a, is a departure for Hardman a little bit. I mean, I think he, one of the things he does really well is, is shadows, but this is even more shadowy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, um, a kind of kinetic quality to his, his line work and, um, the sound effects too oh, definitely. that are in here that um I don't know some in some cases remind me a little bit of even of say like um uh Bill Sienkiewicz. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah. but as I, anyway, so I, I mean I think he's adapted his style to a story that uh works really effectively with um you know the atmosphere he's trying to catch get across. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the sound effects because there's not much dialogue here, but th- the most important text that we get are those sound effects. Uh, the sound effects, that is largely what carries the action. That's what creates the action. Uh, but I think even more significantly, it's what sets the tone. Uh, for example, at the very beginning, the first page of story, we see in the top panel um, – words we can make out crash and what looks to be like scree and crack but there are other letters and words in there that we can't really ferret out and uh, this goes on throughout this issue where there are sound effects here where you can interpret one of any number of ways like what's going on here what is that a sound effect for you know is it someone screaming is it the sound of the wind or might it be the sound of the wings and if if wings what are these things you know you you mentioned the harpy there's something vampiric going on here um and so we're not able or at least I wasn't able to determine much of what was going on with the sound but I think that's that that's part of uh of of uh, you know the beauty of this this uh, one shot is that sound is used or sound effects are used in such a way that it keeps you in the dark mm-hmm. yeah yeah so yeah I I I enjoyed this and uh, maybe uh you know maybe he he he's setting the stage here we'll have other creators who will go on to do other one shots I'm sure that won't be the case but uh, it'd be nice to see more things like this Mhm Yeah 
Yeah, I, I would like I would like to see creators do this more. I, and I like when they when Hardman talks about his motivation to kind of take a break from an ongoing series to exercise these other these other muscles. Um, I like that. I'd like to see more creators try those sorts of things out and maybe, you know, put together then later on a collection of these these shorter pieces mm-hmm. um, like like this. Um, in that in that little afterward, too, Hardman points out that that uh, it that, that several years ago he had drawn this one page pinup of a, a woman with wings lying down and you know looking like she's she's like dead on the ground. Yeah, yeah, and or yeah, our forest and these um uh. And then a bunch of men in the background with flashlights uh, looking like, like I guess police um, are coming uh, are coming across her. That that picture alone is a story, right? You know, <laughs> I, I just I just love everything about that. And and then he just kind of expands on this idea of and and basically what it is is you know uh, humans being exposed to something uncanny. And that is really the essence of horror anyway. Right. Uh, something that they can't explain. And as it goes along, rather than getting kind of more answers, you, you get um, more mystery about it. Right. Yeah. And he does include this pinup that you referenced at the right after the right, afterward. Right. Mm-hmm. So you can see what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is de- yeah definitely a, a great one shot. And, uh, you know, run out to your shop and get this if you haven't pre-ordered it. Yep. Wow, so three very different titles, although two were rather horrific. Uh, we started mm-hmm. off with Stephen Tillotson's Untitled Apes Epic Adventure from Avery Hill Publishing. After that, we looked at an Aftershock title, Blood Blister Number 1, by Phil Hester and Tony Harris. And then we wrapped up with the one-shot from Gabriel Hardman, The Belfry, which is going to be coming out next Wednesday from Image. Right. So three three interesting and different books. Right. And if you want to find interesting titles like this, then please head over to the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to DCBService.com, you will find a ton of specials. And you can't go wrong with those guys. That's DCBService.com. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at Comics Alternative. Uh, You can also get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at ComicsAlternative.com. And you can also check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, let us know how we're doing, and find out what we're doing. That's right. We do like to hear from you. And Andy, we got through the show without your dogs barking. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. They're, they're sitting They're sitting at my feet right now, sleeping. Um one cat is on the table right behind my computer. I think she likes to snuggle up against the warmth of the laptop. And then uh, another cat is sitting on a bench behind me in the window. So I have f- four out of six animals surrounding me at this moment. Wow. And they've all been good. They're getting extra treats tonight. <laughs> 
Oh boy. <laughs> oh great. So we're we're ending on an upbeat positive note and that's a good thing. So yep. uh until next time we which we hope will be upbeat as well. I'm Derek. I'm Andy. See ya.